not totally a stranger to this Santa Barbara area. Uh, in fact, I lived for a year just off the campus on Moore Mesa uh, 20 years ago, 1972, when I was commuting to Ventura as a uh, district attorney, deputy district attorney prosecuting criminal cases. People still remember that as a time when crime was uh, lowered enormously throughout the region. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, on weekends, I would be up here, of, uh, of course, at uh, home, and I used to go bicycling through the campus. And one of the things that I remember was that on weekends, there weren't a lot of people on the campus, uh, uh, partly because there's so many other wonderful things to do. So. Um, I, I had a feeling that it would not be an absolutely packed house uh, on, a, on a beautiful Sunday afternoon in Santa Barbara, but I'm very glad to, uh, to see all of you who were able to come out. As you know, I am a, a, a criminal, sometime criminal lawyer and a professor of uh, law, especially criminal law, at the University of California. When I teach uh, my students about criminal law and police procedure, I try to give them a feeling for the ways that different actors in the system think. So that I talk about judge think, and I talk about cop think, and I talk about suspect think. You know, so that if you have a situation, for example, that there's a, a, a suitcase, let's say, um, and a, a dog that is trained to spot drugs has alerted to the presence of drugs in this suitcase, a judge think would be, ah, yes, the officer should now go and find a judicial officer and get a search warrant to search that suitcase. Whereas, of course, a policeman will think, oh, what a lot of bother. Who would want to do that? Um, let's see if there's some other way we can do that without going through all of this trouble. So that they, they naturally have their, their own viewpoint on the situation because of the, the different roles that they play in the system. So what I thought I might do in this lecture is tell you something about different kinds of um, uh, of thinking that's going on about Darwinian evolution, some of it in response to my book, which is, I'm glad to say, still getting some uh, reviews uh, uh, month by month. I think there were three last month, even though it's almost two years since it's been out. Most of the reviews are pretty critical, I must say, but I'm glad to be getting the attention anyway. Uh, and it's giving, given me a, a lot of opportunity to uh, examine the thinking of other people who deal with these scientific and philosophical subjects. So I'm going to tell you about skeptic think, that is skeptics with regard to Darwinism. That's like me. Um, I'll tell you something about scientific reductionist think. Um, I'll tell you something about philosopher of science think uh, to give you a sense of the way that uh, different people are uh, coming to grips uh, with the problems that have been identified uh, with the reigning scientific paradigm that tells us how we got to be here. Um, now first, um, uh, an introduction to my own views. This is skeptic think. I'm a skeptical about the Darwinian theory of evolution, the paradigm that dominates biological science in our time. Now what does that mean and what, what, what is one skeptical about? Well, the first thing that this skeptic does is to identify the issue. What is the question that's important? Uh, what is it we need to think about? Um, and in that case, there are some things that aren't very important. For example, somebody will say, well, does evolution occur? Well, that depends what you mean by evolution. Um, one of the uh, most prominent examples of evolution in action that all of the books cite is the breeding of domestic animals, or uh, of uh, selective uh, breeding of plants. So you have dog breeding, for example, that gets us all these chihuahuas and Great Danes and whatever, and people will say, well, that's evolution. Well, that certainly does happen. We do have these breed of dogs. Dog breeding does occur. Um, and uh, it's certainly also the case that there's a degree of variation uh, that occurs in plants and animals. If, for example, um, a, a couple of uh, uh, birds uh, migrate to an offshore island and there become isolated and inbreed for generations, there will be a degree of uh, variation that will occur. Um, the processes of migration, inbreeding, mutation, genetic drift, natural selection will produce uh, varieties or even new species of birds which are somewhat different from the mainland population of uh, a similar bird. So, 
Um, evolution in this sense is not really an, an issue. It's some, an observable process. It's an easily inferable process. Um, and it's no big uh, a problem. The question that a skeptic is interested in is the big question. How do you get birds in the first place? Um, the most famous example of evolution in action that is cited in all the books, that is the most famous proof of the uh, process of Darwinian evolution by natural selection, uh, is the case of the peppered moth in the Midlands of England. Uh, during a, a period of time, there was a population of moths which had predominantly light-colored uh, moths in the population, a minority of dark-colored moths. But when the trees were darkened by industrial smoke, the number of dark moths rose and the number of light moths, relatively speaking, declined. Uh, so that for a time you had more dark moths and fewer light moths. And then when the trees became light-colored again, uh, due to cleaning up of the air by air pollution laws, uh, the birds could uh, see the dark moths against the light trees better, um, ate them with abandon, and you had a return to the pre-existing population. Um, a variation uh, in the number of, of uh, light and dark moths. Uh, there were light and dark moths throughout the period of time. Nothing new appeared. Nothing was created. Um, and uh, that's uncontroversial. What the skeptic wants to know is, how do you get moths and trees and birds and scientific observers in the first place? Um, and that's the question that uh, uh, we want to know. How do you start with a simple uh, bacterial cell? Uh, uh, and uh, over a period of time, uh, as the theory uh, claims uh, it has happened, uh, you get a complex uh, plants and animals. Uh, through the operation, of nothing but purposeless material natural processes. That's what's supposed to happen. What the skeptic wants to know is, is that true? Uh, do we know how such a thing can happen? Uh, did it happen as the Darwinian theory says it must have happened through a combination of random genetic changes mutations, recombination, whatever, random genetic changes, uh, plus uh, the sifting, selecting force of natural selection, which is the brute fact that some creatures are better at surviving and reproducing than others, and therefore leave more offspring than others, and therefore uh, come to dominate the population. So that's the question the skeptic wants answered. And how did all of this come about in the first place? How do we get from very simple things to very complicated living things, eventually to ourselves? Indeed, how do we get life started in the first place? Now, in order to focus on that question, this skeptic has found that it's almost essential to adopt a new vocabulary. And the reason is that the old vocabulary is calculated to divert attention uh, from the main issue. Because the old vocabulary speaks of evolution. And evolution turns out to mean just about everything except the strictest form of six-day, young earth, biblical, a fundamentalist, special creation. Um, evolution means dog breeding. Evolution means the variations in the shapes of the beaks of finches on the Galapagos Islands, the variation that occurred, as I've indicated, following migration from the mainland. Um, one uh, eminent professor of my acquaintance um, told me that I must be completely wrong. The theory of evolution must be true because there are flightless birds on Hawaii. Um, he said uh, those birds uh, obviously migrated from a mainland somewhere, and uh, due to inbreeding in Hawaii, they lost the ability to fly, and yet nonetheless they survived uh, until uh, predators were introduced to the islands um, in the uh, 19th century following uh, their discovery by uh, uh, you know, European uh, explorers. Uh, and then, uh, then the flightless birds uh, became extinct. Well, isn't that evolution? Uh, well, of course it is. But what we want to know is not how a bird which was able to fly could become so degenerate as to lose that ability, but rather how 
birds got the ability to fly in the first place, how they became birds. So um, uh, the word evolution inherently distracts attention uh, from the main question. If you say, I want to know how you got birds in the first place, somebody will say, well, the answer is evolution, and look at that breeding that's done. Look at those variations that appear. That's evolution, uh, therefore that's the answer. Evolution means um, uh, uh, everything from the smallest variations to the grand creation story of how we got um, complex plants and animals in the first place. So what I do uh, to try to put attention on the main point is to put aside that misleading word evolution and to speak of what I call the blind watchmaker thesis. Now the blind watchmaker thesis uh, comes from the title of a book by Richard Dawkins, the eminent Oxford University zoologist. And Richard Dawkins uh, tells us at the beginning of that book, that living things appear to be extremely complex entities which look as if they were designed by an intelligent creator for a purpose. Um, that is to say that they look as if they were created by a supernatural being. But, says Richard Dawkins, they were not uh, because we know that the forces of random genetic change and natural selection, purely unintelligent material forces, were in fact capable of doing all of this creating and did uh, do it. That's the blind watchmaker thesis, the thesis that random genetic change and natural selection, rather than pre-existing intelligence and purpose, uh, is behind the existence of all of the extremely complex plant and animal beings, including ourselves, which now populate the planet. Now, it's that thesis, the blind watchmaker thesis, that the skeptic wants to look at. Because that's the important thesis. That's what really matters to people. It doesn't have tremendous importance outside of the scientific classroom or laboratory uh, itself whether you can get a degree of variation in created things which already exist. Um, it's significant that we can breed dogs to get varieties which are particularly good hunters or show dogs or whatever. That's important for people who love dogs. It's important that we can get varieties of orchids. That's important for people who love varieties of flowers. Um, but it isn't of enormous philosophical importance. What's of enormous philosophical and religious importance to us is the question, are we here because a purposeful, intelligent being brought about our existence, or are we here because of the operation of material forces that have no intelligence and have no purpose and inherently can care nothing about us? Biological science, in the form of the Darwinian theory, purports to have answered that question. So is the blind watchmaker thesis true? Now this is the question that the skeptic wants to ask. Now the skeptic will again find a great deal of difficulty in asking that question. I've told you of one form of difficulty that will be presented. The skeptic will be told we have enormous evidence of evolution. The subject will be changed, you see, to provide something simple, something minor, which can be proved. That will be called evolution, and evolution is the answer to how we all came into existence too, and so there's an end of it. Well, we'll put that aside. We've already seen that the word evolution can't be used as an all-purpose uh, answer uh, to the question, how did we get here? Another problem that the skeptic will immediately encounter, however, is that the skeptic will be told, the answer to your question is in the province of science. Science is committed to philosophical naturalism. And therefore, science must assume that no creator and no purposeful intelligence is behind our existence. And that's an end to it. Now that is to say, by this means, an important question has been transformed into a non-question. 
The skeptic wants to ask, is it true what certain scientists tell us, that we are here as a result of purposeless natural forces rather than an intelligent creator? And the skeptic will be answered. Science is so defined.